out. My name is Okiji Kutadeo with WebSmith Lectures. And today we'll be talking about fit of circulation. We'll speak about both the intrauterine and extrauterine peculiarities. In subsequent videos, we'll talk about heart sounds, murmurs, and congenital heart diseases. So, to start off our lecture, fetal circulation. What's special about it? What's different about it? And why do we need to know it? I'll discuss all this during the lecture. First, I'll name three structures we should keep in mind. The ductus venosus, the valley, and ductus arteriosus. To begin with, we are well aware that the fetus gets oxygenated blood from the mother. But how is this done? The connection between the mother and the child is a placenta. And this structure is quite complex and very important. There we have the chorion and the chorion plexus. The blood of the mother and the child never actually come in contact. But through diffusion, oxygen transfers from the mother to the child in the chorion plexus. Okay, let's continue. From this point to the placenta, we have the umbilical cord, right? And the umbilical cord, we have the umbilical vein and umbilical arteries. There are two umbilical arteries. But leave the umbilical artery for the moment. Let's talk about the vein. First of all, what is a vein and what is an artery? And most of us have the impression that the artery has oxygenated blood, the vein has deoxygenated blood. But this is correct 90% of the time. We are well aware that for the umbilical vessels and the pulmonary vessels, it's different. The vein contains the oxygenated blood and the artery contains deoxygenated blood. So, an artery is simply a vessel that leads away from the heart and the vein goes where? To the heart. So, the center of the umbilical vein leads towards the heart and it contains highly oxygenated blood. Now, what's the connection between the umbilical vein and the fetus's circulatory system? Let's go a step at a time. From the umbilical vein, we have an attachment, a connection between the umbilical vein and the inferior vena cava. Now this takes place at the region. This connection between these two veins is ductus venosus. It's simple, umbilical vein, inferior vena cava. The vena cava is what? A major vein. So the connection between these two veins is what? Ductus venosus. Now take note, the umbilical vein contains highly oxygenated blood. But the inferior vena cava contains deoxygenated blood. So you must realize that at this point in time, there's a mix of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Now, this blood goes further, it travels towards the heart. And like in any other heart, the superior and inferior vena cava meets in the right atrium. Now, in the right atrium, we have further mix of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood from the inferior vena cava and superior vena cava into the right atrium. Now, once the blood gets to the right atrium, there are two possible pathways for its movement. It can either go through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, or it can go to the foramen ovale into the left atrium. I mentioned three structures you have to take note of in this lecture. The first, the ductus venosus, the second, foramen ovale. We've discussed the ductus venosus. Now, the foramen ovale, why is it important? Remember, the fetus's lungs are not functional. It gets oxygen from the mother. And so, while in vitro, they are collapsed. Now, because they are collapsed, they result in high pressure. And because of this high pressure, the blood from the right part of the heart cannot easily flow as it normally does in an adult into the lesser circulation. It needs to find another route. And also, the blood is already oxygenated. When you go through the long process of going to the lungs, when you can simply go straight to the body. So go straight to the left part of the heart. And then from the left part of the heart, through the aorta, is disseminated to the rest of the body. So, the increased pressure in the pulmonary system results in what? The inability of the blood to flow in that direction and therefore it bypasses and goes straight to the left atrium through the foramen of the valley 
and from the left atrium, this blood can circulate into the left ventricle, the aorta, and down to the rest of our body. But then, a fraction of the blood still flows through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. It further flows into the pulmonary trunk, the left and right atrium, the left and right pulmonary arteries, and then our lungs. But remember, the pressure is high, and the whole blood that goes still can't get into the lungs. It's not necessary. So we have the third connection, the ductus arteriosus. It connects the iota and the pulmonary trunk. So the excess blood that is not needed in the lungs, we need just a little for the development of the lungs. We don't need so much because it's not going to be oxygenated there. There's no use. So this excess blood is transferred due to the excess pressure, the increased pressure in the lungs and the pulmonary system transfers this blood through the ductus arteriosus into the iota and it flows to the rest of the body for oxygenation. Now the ductus arteriosus, the pulmonary trunk, a big artery, the iota, our largest artery. So the connection between two large arteries, ductus arteriosus. It's simple. Now, remember I mentioned that there are umbilical arteries. Now these umbilical arteries are responsible for carrying deoxygenated blood back to the corium where it gets oxygenated and this cycle continues. Okay, now that we know what the fetal circulation is like, let's discuss what happens at birth. Now, after birth, there are two important things that happen. Two things that modify the circulatory system of the fetus. What are these two things? One, the clamping and disconnection of the umbilical cord. And two, the child's first birth. Now, how do these two things affect the fetus circulatory system? We'll start from the top. Ductus venosus. Now, ductus venosus, as we all know, is a connection between what? The umbilical vein and the inferior vena cava. But since the umbilicus has been cut, it loses its function. And as we know, every single organ or tissue or cell in our body that does not function undergoes what? Dystrophy and atrophy. It's no different for this one. And what happens? It becomes a ligament called ligamentum venosum. Simple. Next, the foramen ovale. Now, to understand what happens to the foramen ovale, it's important that we first know the structure of this foramen. The interatrial septum is actually made up of, let me say, two membranes. We can say there are two walls that come into one. Now, the foramen ovale is found on one wall called the septum secundum, and it has a hole. So you can assume that this is a wall and this is a hole. And then we have on the septum primum. The septum primum forms a flap. Now this is towards the left atrium and this is towards the right atrium. So an increase in pressure here with fluid results in opening of this flap. But even if the pressure here is higher than pressure here, this flap will close. So fluid ordinarily cannot pass from the left atrium to the right atrium. So it's like a door. We know most doors can only open in one direction. At least the brain can only open in one direction. So my type of pressure puts in the other direction remains closed. So now what happens at the bridge? Remember I said there are two things of the process. The first thing is the clamping of the umbilical cord and as well as the first breath. So now the first breath is very important. Why? Because it changes the pressure system of the child. While in the mother, the pressure in the right part of the heart is higher than the pressure in the left part of the heart. Why is this? Due to the high resistance in the lungs. But now that the child is taking its first breath, this resistance is greatly diminished and the blood can easily pass through, can easily go from the right atrium to the right ventricle and to the lungs. So what happens? The pressure in the right part of the heart drastically decreases. Now, as the pressure in the right of the heart is increasing, the pressure in the left part of the heart is increasing. Why? Now, since blood is going to the lungs, it can also come, it, it will also come back to the heart. When it comes back, it comes to what? The left atrium. And not just that, there's increase in peripheral resistance. So the increase in peripheral resistance and the extra blood coming to the left atrium from the lungs increases the pressure in the left 
compared to the reduced pressure in the right. And remember that flap. There's increased pressure here, but because of that flap, blood can go back. So what happens? It temporarily closes. And with time, we have formation of fibers and it permanently closes. Although this does not occur in everybody, but normally it should close. So that's the maximum of closure for the foramen ovale. So it becomes a fossa ovale after this closure. Now, the ductus arteriosus. Okay, this is a little bit more complex. Why? Because it involves not just mechanical flows and pressures. Instead, it involves substances. It involves oxygen, concentration of the blood, and prostaglandin. These are the two most important. There are actually others, including neuropinephrine, bradykinase, and the others. But these two are the most important. Now, the endothelium of the ductus arteriosus is very sensitive to oxygen, to the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. So now with increased oxygen level, the small muscles of the ductus venous arteriosus undergoes what's vasoconstriction, so it constricts. And while in the body, it's kept open by prostaglandin, prostaglandin E2 specifically, and it's pro prostaglandin is produced in great quantity by the placenta. So when you have the cleavage and the cutting of the placenta, it loses its major source of prostaglandin, which is responsible for vasodilation and keeping it open. So now, since we have no prostaglandin to keep it open, and we have high oxygen to close it, it closes. Now, after this constraint occurs, due to lack of nutrition, eventually the cells die. And that's how we have the closure of these three vessels. With this, we come to the end of this video. Hope you guys liked it. Hope it was informative. If it was informative, then like, share. If you have any questions, any suggestions, just comment down below. And once again, I'm Daniel from Voice Med Lectures. And see you next time. My name is Ruben Gonzalez, and this is personal.